I want to begin by simply telling you some of the things that are coming up in the next month or two. In particular, I want to tell you the kind of work that Derek is going to be doing for us. Um, you might say that we are about to have a new normal. You know, when we, we first started this church, it was very different from what any of us were used to. And then those of you who came in at various times, most likely it was different from whatever you were used to. We all have that in common. We had to get used to a new normal. But now, we're about to go into some territory that's going to be a new normal for all of us. And our goal is to balance a couple of things, both of which are very important. On one hand, it is absolutely important, it's not the word, essential, priceless. We've got to keep the spirit and the fellowship that we've got just as it is and not mess with that. And we're not going to do anything that might even remotely mess with that. In fact, we even designed this new building in such a way that is meant to have a breakfast in the same room where you worship, just like we have here, because we found that, that, that there's something about that that works well for this group of people. That's going to be the same. But what's going to be different? The answer is, we've got to start a whole lot of new ministries. And that's the part I've got to balance. That's the part you've got to help hold in balance. Holding on to who we are, to that spirit, and letting it even grow more, because it can. And at the same time, start lots of new ministries that are going to reach lots of new people in lots of new ways. I think most everybody here likes what we've had for the last two and a half years. And so if I use that old saying that you've all heard, if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. Well, for us, would that be such a bad thing? No, it wouldn't be a bad thing if we kept doing just what we've always done and getting what we've always got. It would be a good thing. But remember, the good is the enemy of the best. And we have done as much as we could with the resources we had, with the facilities we had. But we're about to be given a whole bunch more. And remember what Jesus said about this kind of thing? To whom much is given, of him shall much be required. It is our duty to God, to the people we're here to serve and reach in this county. It's our duty to take the resources he's given us, invest them in a whole lot of new ways. And that's an important place, an essential place where Derek comes into the picture. Um, I, the most important two things I've learned that I can do, no, I'll make it three. Preaching and the preparation that comes with that. Visiting, whether it be evangelistic visiting or sick visiting or just staying in touch vis visiting that's that's an essential and and the third one is leadership i'm i've got to lead the way i got to show you where we're going why we're going there why that's important and how to bring our resources together so as to make that happen but that's a more than a full-time job and if we just kept doing that not much new um, would happen. 
So Derek is coming at just the right time. The timing of this is amazing because he's coming at just about the point where it was getting out of my hands. And God, you know, it says, we'll never put more on you than you can bear, but he'll always provide a way. And he's done that very faithfully. He's not only sent me an assistant, an associate to, to work with me, this is an assistant and an associate who is good and gifted and experienced in the very areas where I'm weakest and least gifted and and that is what I want to share with you in detail. You could say there's three phases to what we're doing here, Derek's job. Phase one, he is going to be the person in charge of getting us set up in this new building. That is a much bigger undertaking than the casual observer would even begin to imagine. We're talking about more than just moving some furniture into a building and turning the lights on. We're talking about, for example, a Wednesday night service from scratch. We've not had that in the past, by the way. You know what that means? With the exception of those of you who've been going to adult Bible studies, those two classes, which is maybe 10% of the group here, 15 at the most. Most of us are not in the habit of coming to church on Wednesday night. And that's going to be a new normal for you. And we're going to need you there because you have to have people to attract people, and I expect that there's going to be a ton of people there the very first Wednesday night. Um, looks like we've got a, a cook hired, by the way. Um, Jack Holland is apparently going to be our cook. We have four different, um, four different applicants for the custodial position. It'll be a part-time, one-day-a-week custodial position, and all four of them are from our church. I'm not sure how we're going to handle that. What we don't have is people, we don't at this point have anybody who's confirmed and committed to taking on the nursery worker job. We want to hire two nursery workers for the little kids. That's a hard thing to find. If you got any connections, please send them our way. Eric is going to be overseeing all that. And that means that starting the day, if you've got questions about anything related to any of that, he's your man. And his phone number's in your bulletin. And <laughs> he's got a, and he, even, he, he, he has not yet got a mean a number. And I don't know if he will or not. Well, if he does, if he gets one, I'll make sure you got it. But he already has his, his CCF email, and that should be in your bulletin as well. He's going to be in charge of setting up the Wednesday night. The biggest thing and most complex is, of course, the children's ministry. We're going to put everything we got in the children's ministry. And, of course, Tracy Hensley is the main person orchestrating that. So very early on, Derek is going to start working with her in the planning of that so that the very first night, Wednesday night, things work. Everybody knows what to do. Uh, the volunteers, we're not scrambling around for volunteers at the last minute, calling people on Wednesday afternoon at 4.30, can you please come? We don't have anybody for, for middle school or whatever. Well, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Derek's going to take care of that. Derek and Tracy Hensley are going to take care of that. I got confidence in them. I do. We're going to, uh, our schedule is going to be 5.30 to 7.30. The goal is on Wednesday night that 
a family can come, everybody gets there at the same time, and they can ride together because they all leave at the same time. The only group I can think of that might be staying later, in fact, will be staying later, is though, are, are those people who are going to be in the congregational choir, those people sitting out in the choir who practice the songs on Wednesday night. Um, Derek will take care of the daily operations of the office, all the communications, make sure everything is communicated clearly and effectively. He's going to supervise these part-time people as well as the secretary and media tech. That's phase one. Then there's phase two. As soon as those things are in place, in fact, there's going to be some overlap here. We've got to get some recreational stuff out there just as quick as we can. I would really like it if we could have two volleyball courts ready to go when we move in, have them have good quality volleyball courts, the kind that sand pits that you can really dive and go for the ball, that sort of thing. And from what I understand, there's really not a good one, uh, one in good shape in the county. And so we're going to be offering something that people can't just get any old place. That's going to be one of the first things we want to do. In time, we want to get basketball, possibly softball. We're going to look into the possibility of upward flag football, which is a Christian-based flag football team. We're going to league. That would be at a different time of the year from regular peewee. That's just the kind of thing we're going to investigate. Again, the goal is to offer things that are not already offered everywhere else. Um, when, when, you, when we start a new church, we do not start by saying, okay, what are all the things that every church has? What are all the events on their calendar? Because we've got to make sure and get all those events on our calendar. That would be a terrible mistake when you consider that most churches are not doing all that well. And many of those programs that they're operating were started at a time when they were on the spot and they worked wonderfully. We're not going to do anything just because other churches or past churches we've been part of did them. We're going to do what fits this particular group of people and the people that we're reaching, this particular community. Um, I'll give you real quick a preview of some ministries that are going to be set up where you will have the opportunity to work hands-on, face-to-face with people, individual people who need your involvement. The simplest of those is that we're going to start, this will be one of the very first things we start. It's pretty simple, and it's nothing all that unusual about it. We're going to start a discipleship program for every new believer, every person who becomes a Christian and is baptized will be, will be given a mentor. We will give you an opportunity to volunteer as a mentor, we'll recruit mentors, and we'll train the mentors, we'll select a curriculum, and that perhaps even more than one curriculum and create our own that fits well, fits best here. We'll have a curriculum for kids and for adults, and we'll have one-on-one -on -one mentors you'll meet once a week, minimum, with the new convert, so that we don't just baptize them and say, good luck, uh, or baptize them and forget them. There has to be follow-up. The Bible says in 1 Peter that a new Christian is like a newborn babe. They've got to be fed the milk of the word. Newborn babes require a lot of attention and care because they're, they've been, they're, they don't yet know how to feed themselves. We're going to make sure we have that. Very simple, but very important. We're also going to recruit and train some mentors for a type of ministry that is probably done other places. I'm sure it is. I just haven't seen it in place. We want to recruit a group of men and women to mentor boys and girls 
long about the age of 12, 13, somewhere in there, uh, that three or four year gap where they're entering puberty or in the middle of it, that's an important and, and that's an important time to shape a kid. Now, my initial thought in the beginning was, we'll do this for kids who are in single-parent families. They got a, a, a boy who's being raised by a single mother, and he has very little male role model or contact. And obviously, that's one of the first people we want to make sure is involved. But then it hit me. There are kids all over the place with both parents, but somehow, you look around the county and the town, somehow a whole lot of kids are not being taught some of the most important things in life. And our goal is to fill in whatever gap there is in the instruction they receive from their parents. We're not out to compete with the parents. We're, we're out to assist the parents. And that means that some, some kids may need help in only one or two areas. Some area that maybe all the, let's say the, the parents were uncomfortable and just never could really have, carry out a good talk with the child about sex. We'll do that. We'll find men who can talk comfortably with the boys about that and explain to them what's happening in their hormones, in their bodies, help them understand the differences in boys and girls besides the obvious ones they're looking at, help them understand the different mentality and do the same for the girls. Help them understand how a boy thinks. That he's not after the same things you're after. He's not interested necessarily in the same things you're interested in. Here's how his mind works, young man. Here's how her mind works. Understanding things that they need to know about dating. And we can get really practical with, with, with a girl. Some, some of you ladies would really get a... You would love doing this. You... You, it could be your job to tell a girl what to do on a date. What to wear, where to sit, what not to do, how to slap a face if necessary. <laughs> All sorts of things that a lot of kids are not being taught and they need very much to be taught. Last thing I'll say about that is we want to make it practical as well. We want to raise boys who know how to run a chainsaw, who can change a tire, who can change the oil in their car, who know how to clean a fish and a squirrel, and women who know how to frown. <laughs> no, we'll, we will teach both ways there now. We'll teach both ways. Really, we're talking about things like etiquette, boys, how to shake a hand. You shake hands, you look the man in the eye, you give him a firm grip, you look... How is a boy going to know that if nobody teaches him that? And how many parents are really going to teach it? Here, we're going to develop a team of men and a team of women to work with the boys and the girls. And then uh, one last one I'll mention is life coaching for adults. Life coaching is not counseling. Life coaching is, is helping a person either starting up in their career or starting over in their career. So you got a kid who's fresh out of school, but he runs through two or three jobs in a hurry and it's not working, and he's thinking, oh, I must have taken the wrong path, and maybe he did. What's he supposed to do? There needs to be somebody, some person who's done it well and successfully and knows how to meet with this boy, this girl, and come to understand this young person's strengths and weaknesses. I mean, give them a personality test, strength 
and weakness assessment test. The kind of thing that can help them put together a plan for life. Something they certainly would never think of on their own. Somebody that can lead them through the process of actually writing out a list of goals with a target date and action steps that I've got to do this by October of 2019 and I've got to be at that place by October of 2020, etc. That, by the way, carries right over to a person who's, to an adult who's in a start over phase. Say a person at midlife or maybe even a little later in life. They find themselves just sort of lost, not in a spiritual sense, but in a professional sense. What am I supposed to be doing? Uh, this job is killing me. Uh, or I'm, I just can't make a living the way I'm doing. I've got to do something different, but I don't know what. I don't know where, when, how. Life coaching will be offered for those people, and it will be offered for free. It's a service we want to offer to, obviously, members of the church, but the community as a whole. They do not have to be and will not have to be members of our church in order to benefit. There will not be any pressure. We're not using... We're not going to try to do the Holy Spirit's work for him and try to manipulate. Well, now, if you will come this number of Sundays, we will give you this many sessions. None of that. Spirit is working in a person, and he has given them a desire, drawing them to Christ, and they meet a person like you, many of you who are working with them and, and asking nothing from them other than do what's necessary to change your life. They will not have to be coerced. It is a way of evangelism it will reach a lot of unchurched people but it's not just a trick to lure them in it is to help them now Terry has got a lot to do and I'm going to let you I'm going to let Derek come now and tell you a little about himself um, and how he got to where he is, how God has prepared him for this place in life. All right. Good morning. Uh, so happy to be here. Uh, my wife and I, we drove in yesterday, uh, coming through Mina. Beautiful weather. Rolled my windows down. I was just smiling. I think even just like shouted. Just I was so happy to be here. Um, been hearing about the church through Lance and just kind of seeing what you're doing and my excitement just grows and grows and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, but guys, first I want to talk about my wonderful wife Jennifer and just kind of how we came together because I really think it's a, a special story um, because I just find her to be such a special woman. Uh, we met while we were both working as interns in a church in Fort Smith. Um, she was a missions intern working with the missions pastor there. And um, I joined there as the, the college ministry intern, just working with young adults. And um, people kind of talking and telling her she should meet me and I should meet her. And we're like, okay, cool, whatever, um, we'll do that. And so we did, we met each other. And, um, but at this point, Jennifer um, was going to be leaving for London for a two-year stint with the International Mission Board um, later on that year. This was in May. Um, and so I found that to be very interesting. Um, I'll try not to tell this whole story. I could go on about 45 minutes. It's a great story. We constantly debate about when the first date was, and I think I'm winning on counts of that now that we tell people more and more. But anyways, um, we, we got to know each other. I wanted to hear about what she was doing, why she was going to London. I was so interested just to hear that process. I, maybe I want to do it myself. Um, and she was interested in thinking maybe we were going out on a date through all this, but, um, but through that, we, we just kept talking, and we were serving at the church together and ministry together, and just really were coming to find that we shared this heart for ministry, this, this heart for church planning even, and that's just what we, we felt just the calling to dedicate our life to, and just through that process of just talking about our spiritual walk, we just we fell in love and um, decided that we wanted to proceed in our lives together. 
Um, and so, of course, she didn't go to London. She would still be there if that was the case. Um, so we, we, like, we just moved forward together, and um, we ended up getting married, and we decided to spend our first year and a half in Seattle, Washington, uh, where we worked with a church plant up there through the North American Mission Board, um, just helping them. At, they're a very young church. They still tow a trailer to church every morning and drag it all out, set it all up, and um, a lot of manual labor. It's amazing what that church does there. And so we helped them with that. We helped out with their worship ministry, and it's just been a great way to start a marriage, to start a relationship with someone, just entering into ministry um, together as, as partners. And so I'll tell you that just because the rest of kind of my story and ministry experience, um, when, when I was experiencing things for the last several years, I was in ministry at the age of 18, I, I would have these different experiences and opportunities that just didn't really seem to kind of mesh together. I didn't really know what was going to happen. Um, but as we met each other and we started doing these, hold on, let me, let me back up. Let me kind of go before all that. Um, through ministry, I've had the opportunity to serve in very traditional type roles. I guess you could call it. Um, I've got a lot of experience working with children. That's really great. Um, I'm really good at getting them excited and then sending them home to the parents, and people usually ended up mad about that. But I just, I just love children. I love playing with them. They're so so excited, so full of life. Um, so much to be said about that. Um, worked a lot with youth, um, a lot of experience with young adults. Um, I just I love kind of like my age group, the millennial kids and just our dreams and passion for life and stuff. It's really cool. And so I love to kind of like take that and capture it and give it a, the right kind of focus. And um, even for myself, uh, sometimes can be a struggle. Um, and then also just wor working in like worship ministries and just doing that and uh, discipleship, small groups, just huge passions of mine. And so throughout life, um, my during college, I had the opportunity to program and design ministries for college students and kind of facilitated those as well. Out of college, um, I, I went and worked in California with a, with a ministry that led backpacking rock climbing trips in the Sierras, and I helped them program those trips, again, working with young um, adults and just doing ministry there, um, very unique experience. Um, and then meeting, being with Jennifer and working in Seattle and helping them to program and, and build up that church from a young church. Um, just always having a huge heart for ministry. Um, and so that kind of brings me to, to here, to CCF. Um, I, I've seen the church being built for the last couple years. I, guys, I grew up um, most of my life, all my life, down Highway 88 East. Um, just, and so I've always been driving by whenever I come by to see my, uh, visit my family. And I've seen it grow up, and I was like, I wonder what that place is. That's cool. That's exciting. Um, and so when Rodney kind of approached my father and then kind of threw me about what this church was doing and started to learn about this church, um, I became very intrigued, uh, especially when I started talking to Lance. And he told me how this church took form um, because I really didn't have a clue. Um, I knew a couple things that I heard, but uh, I don't, that didn't mean a whole lot to me. And so when he started telling me how, how you as a church came together, came to him like, hey, come preach for us, and just really just took hold and led the way in this and continue to do so. And I look out here and uh, still a very young church, but so many great people with smiles on their face and just so excited about what's going on. It's just, it's contagious. And so when I heard all that, I knew this is a place that I wanted to be involved with somehow. Uh, I didn't know what that was going to be, but I just saw that something was happening, that the church was behind the pastor and working and moving forward to do ministry like it's never been done before. And that, that's exciting to me. And so I'm looking forward to coming in, bringing my experience of just programming ministries, leading ministries, uh, training up leaders um, for all the things that we're going to get to do, guys. And so thank you so much for all your encouragement, um, making us just feel right at home. Um, I've loved it. I can't wait um, just to continue building our relationships. Most of you know me when I was just a child, and so um, help me to remember those times as well um, as we just build those relationships. And, guys, again, just thank you so much for having Jennifer and I, and uh, please come to me with any questions or anything about the future, and um, I want to work with you guys moving forward. So thanks so much. I'm going to say a few things to wrap us up. Um, there's never enough time to say it all. But this is what I want you to 
here in, in the closing today. On that day, I mentioned in the prayer at the beginning, February 2015, a group of people came together for the first time not knowing what to expect. We had, we didn't know if there'd be 12 people or more like 200. We didn't know if this was going to be a one-time thing or if it was going to be something we'd do for a while. The one thing we could not have imagined is the way God has worked in it. But on that very first day, and many times since then, I brought a particular verse to your attention. And it's a verse I want you to look at once again. It's Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43, beginning verse 18. It's a verse I learned as a child. I've quoted it my whole life, but I've never seen it apply to anything, anybody, any situation the way it has this church. And it started that first day when I read these words to you. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. God has done all of that. And there's even more of it for him to do. And there's even more to come that we cannot possibly see from where we are right now. From any vantage point in life, you can only see so far ahead. You can always see back. But looking back is a terrible way to live, and it's an easy way to get tripped up. Lot's wife looked back, and she never looked forward again. Jesus said, he that puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not worthy. That kind of mentality of always looking back, especially looking back and talking about negative stuff, never takes us anywhere. And I'm talking about your personal lives right here. This applies to everybody. You've never been here before and you never been and you never come back again. Remember that. No good comes from looking back at all the negative things. Once you've learned the lesson of it, you move on. That day, in the beginning, we were like 1 John 3 2. And that verse says. Dear friends, now we are the children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. And then it goes on to apply that in the ultimate sense. The ultimate sense of we'll really know the whole big picture of what God's doing and who we are when Christ returns and we see him face to face. But it's also true in the little ways. It's true in you, it's true in me. It does not yet appear what we shall be. 1 Corinthians 3.17 is one other one I want you to see. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That's the verse you see on the back of these shirts. And more than any other verse, this is the one that has come to characterize what I think most of us feel at CCF. It says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. What I'm saying is that whether you came into this, when you, whether your path crossed the CCF path and you joined it two weeks ago or two years ago, there's a lot we don't know. But we do know this, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. 
And we know the truth of Galatians 5.22 says, The fruits of the Spirit are these. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. These are the things that I see cultivated in all of your lives. I've got more of those things in me now than I did when I began. And once again, go to you as a whole. I see it again and again. Whether it's two weeks or two years you've been with us. That's what we know, that the Spirit is among us. We know that He's with us, and we know the Bible tells us He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. God finishes what he starts, and so will we. You finish it. You be part of it. You be part of that picture that we've only just begun sketch out this morning.